we can t we can go. I, I want to give you a chance to kind of warm up. To right, come right. All this. So we can start back, kind of what we did last time, with you in the crib and the walls. <laughs> the right, letters, right, which right. Which is beautiful. Uh -huh. um, and then go from there to, to picking up the specifics. And at each point we stop along the road, um, you know, wherever that, wherever fires off in you, let's just take a pause break and go into it. Um, what I'm looking to do is we have, um, we've got, you know, anthropological, anthropologist slash linguists talking about the beginning and the emergence of coming into speaking. Uh -huh. and we've got um, other people talking about the beginnings of writing, but not at the 6,000 year level. You know, most things are post-alphabet, mm -hmm. um, like uh, Frank Cross and the you know, discovery of Z, uh -huh. and, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, did you interview Frank Cross? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great. Huh. Great yeah no, I know his good work. Yeah. Huh. Oh, good. Um, yeah. So, uh, but what we're, what we're wanting to do is to, you know, again, reveal the, the power this invention the alphabet has as a command and how it's connected to uh, the things that changed in the world, that changed the world human beings grow and evolve inside of. And so the Hebrews, the Greeks, and then later the piece about uh, you know, the breakdown of phonetic correspondence. We also did right. John Fisher. Do you know John Fisher? The name is familiar. What he is he? The emergence of standard English. Oh, so we okay. To, we talked to Vanesky. Uh huh. Right? Uh huh. Vanesky said, if you really want to understand where English came from, you got to talk to Fisher. Okay. And Fisher was a guy that was a manuscript expert and who teased out the emergence of the standardization of English to the Chancery scribes under Henry V. Uh huh. Yeah, and it's an so, administrative effect. Yeah. And, and, right. But we end up in this trip into these 26 scribes who, who are. You know, Latin trained, think English is a peasant language. You right, know? right. They're, they're mapping the system. Right. That we read all later. You know, right, right. Yeah, no, it's interesting to think about how standardization comes about because it's often an, an, an effect of some kind of administrative decision making, like Charlemagne and the use of the Carolingian minuscule in the 8th century because he wanted to be able to administer his kingdom effectively. But it's also become, you know, it also becomes a sign of control. I mean, we can standardize the script, and the script is recognizable in every usage as the instrument of the state carries a tremendous impact. But let's go back for a moment and think about um, the bigger questions here. Most people who hear the word alphabet are confused about precisely what that term applies to. And alphabet is not synonymous with writing systems. There are several different writing systems that have been invented in the course of human history. There's actually only one alphabet. It has many visual forms that are currently in use, but we can trace most of those forms back to a common root, which is the Proto-Canaanite alphabet that emerged sometime around 1800 BC in the Sinai Peninsula. Earlier writing systems existed. Cuneiform, which emerged in the Uruk civilization and in the Tigris and Euphrates Valley, becomes a writing system, that is a system for representing language, sometime around 3000 BC. But it was used as a set of numeric tokens for exchange among merchants and record keeping. And that system of tokens emerged sometime around 6,000 BC and possibly earlier. Of course, the great expert in that is Denis Schmont Besserat. So as a stable code, cuneiform goes back far earlier than any alphabetic system and far earlier than any system that represents language per se. Chinese writing, which is the other really highly used current form of script, emerged sometime around 1700-1500 BC in China. It seems to have had a completely independent origin from any other script. Likewise, the Indus Valley script, Easter Island script, a number of African scripts, and other local phenomena did emerge. They, did, they weren't long-lived. They disappeared. So, truthfully, the only writing systems currently in use are the Chinese script and alphabetic forms of writing.
But then this notion of the alphabet becomes confused in many folks' minds because that Proto-Canaanite alphabet actually had some early offshoots, one that gave rise to Biblical Hebrew, one that branches off quite early and gives rise to all of the South Arabic scripts. And then it becomes Proto-Elamite, and from that we get two major branches, one of which becomes Greek, and then Roman, and then our contemporary you know, alphabet that we use, that we learn for Western languages. And the other main branch of the Proto-Elamite script becomes the foundation of all of the South Asian scripts, so that you get, you know, the Tamil, and you get Georgian, and you get, you know, all of that stuff that moves across Asia. So there are two main branches there that come much later. The alphabet as we know it, as we think of it, is the alphabet that we get from um, the Phoenicians, who got it from the Semites, who then pass it to the Greeks and the Etruscans, who then pass it to the Romans, who then become the instrument for spreading it throughout Western Europe, of course, as part of the Roman, uh, Holy Roman Empire. Um, maybe I might drop out of my theory here, but um, it seemed like you went from the Hebrews to the Greeks without going through the Phoenicians. No, I, I, I got the sequence backwards. I, I, I think I, I said it in the wrong order. Let me restate it again. Okay. So. Of the two main branches of the Proto-Elamite script, one is developed in the Sinai Peninsula, goes to the Phoenicians, who then spread it to the Greeks and Etruscans, who then pass it to the Romans, who then pass it throughout Western Europe. So that's the alphabet, the alphabetic visual form that we recognize. The structure of the alphabet as a sequence of 17, then 21, and in some cases 24, 25 symbols, is the same in all the alphabets I mentioned. So even though the letter forms look different and the number of symbols that comprise the alphabet might be different according to the adaptation of a local phenomena, local linguistic phenomena, the sequence of letters starting from the 17 symbols that are part of the early Proto-Elamite script remain the same into the contemporary alphabet. It's one of the remarkable things about the alphabet is that the sequence of letters, the sequence in which we you know, understand A, B, C, D, E, F, G, remains stable. Now, there isn't always a G. There isn't always an E. And again, the, the, value, the sound values and the reading values attached to those symbols may vary. But the fixed set of symbols is so old that we know it was used in the Sinai Peninsula around 1700 BC in the turquoise mines as a fixed sequence that was used to assemble architectural forms. In other words, you want to build a building and you have a set of bricks or elements that you're shipping somewhere, you use the alphabet and mark them because that sequence is fixed and people will know that's the order in which to assemble those elements. Um, do you know, this just comes in kind of as an interesting tangent for a moment, do you yourself know what uh, some of the alternate sound values sounded like? Um, I don't know. The, I, the, the ones I'm familiar with are really, the, for instance, the, the thorn that was used for English, which was dropped. Um, from the, there wasn't actually a sign for the thorn, and it's, it sounds like the beginning of the th. Okay, so it's a sound, and it had a letter. And you can see it in Old English, but then it gets, um, you know, it disappears when you have uh, printing type come in. And, and really, the, the way that printing type standardizes the alphabet is not insignificant because the um, technology of uh, printing and the technology of foundries and of typesetting and the distribution of typefaces, that also enacts a standardization. And of course, once you have print and the proliferation of a lot of written artifacts, that helps to create standardization as well. You were commenting on the use of the long S in 18th century printing. And there's no reason not to use a long S. Um, as I said to you, I'm not sure what the usage conventions were, but it drops out as the modern eye starts to see it as a peculiar thing. We read so much by shape and by word shape. We don't read letter by letter. We don't pronounce letter by letter, as of course you know. And as a matter of fact, if you try to teach people to read letter by letter, it's very confusing, um, especially in a language like Eng English, where the alphabet that we use for the English language was never designed for the English language. You've probably run into people who've talked about George Bernard Shaw's desire to 
you know, bring about a much more suitable alphabet for, um, to, to, uh, for the teaching of English and also for the pronunciation of English and the use and general usage. But um, the English language has about 40 different phonemes that are significant by which we mean sound values that your ear picks up in order to make the distinctions that make meaning. Our alphabet only has 26 symbols, and so therefore we're always compromised in certain areas by having to represent sounds with symbols that weren't designed to suit those sounds. Now, we learn. We learn as children, and we're you know, sort of brought into a cultural environment where we become habituated to those relationships, but there's nothing natural about it, nothing at all. Great. You said, uh, just to come back and kind of touch into that for a second, you mentioned that um, you don't read letter by letter. Clearly, um, the accomplished reader doesn't do that, and that we're not trying to teach people to do that, and yet we are suggesting in the way that we educate children um, that they have to get from the letters to sound en route to perhaps transcending sound if they get to be really good visual all at once readers. But right. in the beginning stages, the code has to cue a, a virtual or actual experience of, of the right. spoken language for it to take off. Right. right. And therein lies the rub. Right. Yeah, I think it's extremely difficult to um, understand the complexity of that set of relationships. In other words, writing is its own form of language. And we know this if we learn how to read a foreign language, that you might have no idea of the sound, but you can learn to decipher that code. On the other hand, you can learn to hear a language and speak it without ever really knowing how it's spelled or how it looks on a page. Connecting those two codes is a third operation. So we have writing as one code that you can read. We have sound as a code you can understand. And then we have making the relationship between writing and the sound. And that, again, is not a natural relationship. It's a learned relationship. It's not even as simple a relationship as, the, as that that exists between a musical score and a sound, because a musical score, though it room, leaves room for interpretation and inflection and expression, really does try to delineate the sequence of notes that a performer is to actually strike on a particular instrument. Our vocal apparatus is nowhere near as precise as a set of piano keys. So again, figuring out how to shape the mouth and make those sounds so that they conform to those codes is another a level of learning experience. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> what concerns us in, in this particular thing is the artificially confusing ambiguity that has to be worked out at such incredible speed to be able to read fluently. Right. And that if you don't read fluently, then there is all the downward stuff of what doesn't work. You know, there's a certain point of, in order to get up to it and have it start to become transparent enough to pull you into it and to use it and so forth. When we go in and we talk to neuroscientists about you know, what's going on, how fast does it have to happen, how right. fast do we have to collapse the field of what this letter or the group of letters might be into what it actually is in order to assemble a recognizable word at right. the time, I mean, it's boggling. Right. It's a kind of confusing confusion between letters and sounds that's not like the kinds of confusions that exist in the pure soundscape mm -hmm. of, of oral language, differentiating all right. Language. It's right. a different order altogether. Right. And um, not that I want to go off into this, I'm just, this connects with where you were, and so uh, right. this is a really uh, juicy piece that we're exploring in our conversations. With, there's only a few neuroscientists in the entire world that dare go in this space. Uh-huh. Right, to think about the processing complexity for the yeah. brain. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, the, the, the difficulty, of course, is that trying to change this code would be equally mind-boggling. I mean, what, what amazes me, I was doing some work on early writing systems recently for another project, and the Phoenician letter forms and the early sort of, you know, earliest proto-alphabetic forms were constantly before my eyes. And then I was out in the landscape and I would see billboards and signs on the sides of trucks 
and I would think, that's amazing. Those are actually Phoenician letter forms, and they aren't that different. And that's, you know, 4,000 years, modestly speaking, of those forms being in existence. And suddenly there, I had this incredible, uncanny feeling of this ancient culture. It's as though it's the sort of, you know, mind code of an ancient culture still with us. Very few things that we use in daily life that have that living legacy, you know, still active with them. The wheel, fire, you know, uh, forks, knives, a couple other things. But really, it's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm meeting children of the code. We are as much. We are children of the I know. effect of all this. We I know. That in our, inside of our mind. No, it's truly amazing. <laughs> Trying to change it is, you know, I said, no, equally mind-boggling because of the amount of legacy. There's the cultural legacy and the risk, in fact, of losing cultural legacy if we change the code. And we see that problem all the time when we watch the ways in which people struggle with Old English or even with unfamiliar typefaces. Black letter, for instance, which is a face that we tend to look at as something very complex and it's difficult for us to recognize the letter forms in those faces. That's a font that was considered extremely legible to a 15th and 16th century eye that was accustomed to it. So, you know, there are people who will say, and, um, you know, certainly Zuzana Lichko of Emigre Type Design will say that, you know, legibility is habit and you can become habituated. So I think that's true. I mean, you can also become habituated to walk on three legs and to, you know. Um, and beds of nails. Yeah, and beds of nails. Well, I don't consider the alphabet to be a bed of nails myself, but, um, you know, uh, I'm fond of my little, you know, stick figure friends. So, but. And, and back to the point about the Phoenicians and the legacy, though, the, it's the visual element. The, the way that the um, visual elements represent sounds, mm -hmm. and how they have to be assembled to create words in the English language, is, uh, is 500 years old. Why do you say that? Um, the, well, we can go into that. that that's my understanding, say 1530s, you know, uh -huh. uh, when, uh, 1430s. When King Henry V and his scribes. Oh, I see. When you get a kind of standardized alphabet. Well, I mean, you have to realize, of course, visual, you know, written literacy was, comes and goes in different cultures. In other words, there's a fairly high standard of literacy, that is, the capacity to actually read the alphabet as a code for writing in the classical world. And in Rome, there's a very high level of literacy. So, you know, the. Uh, you speak to that, the percentages? I mean, we've heard 10, 12 percent in Greece. Uh, yeah, apparently. You, in, didn't, you didn't go into that. Yeah, I, I guess I was reading some other things because of this uh, other project I'm involved with, and it seems as though literacy levels in Rome are like 40, 50 percent. Um, it's a small population. Um, so I think that, again, you know, we have to sort of uh, be fairly precise about looking at the, at the particular cultural environment that we're talking about. Now, if you're going to go outside of Rome into a, a peasant environment in you know, early Italy, you're not going to find a high level of literacy. But what percentage of the population is concentrated in the Roman capital? And then of that population, what percentage actually has access to literacy? So you know, I think that um, you know, the relationship of coded writing to practices of literacy would vary a lot population by population. And, you know, if we look into the Jewish tradition, where literacy is very much a part of the religious practice, then for the male population of the long-standing Jewish tradition, there's a very high level of literacy. And in fact, you know, the children of the book, I mean, those are the people of the book, that's really the core of Jewish learning, teaching, and faith is to be able to read the scriptures. So even though women were not, you know, sort of uh, given that opportunity um, to the same degree, um, the, the male children and the male culture was almost entirely literate. So there's an entire people for whom literacy goes back, 
again, 5,000 years. So I think um, it's true that in modern cultures, the use of standard teaching for literacy and reading practices comes much later. We don't start to have a need for a highly literate population in the workforce until industrialization because it's at that point that the modern office worker starts to have a need for the skills that are involved in literacy in order to process the, you know, to be part of that secondary apparatus of the business world. So if we look at modern Europe, we have a different situation. If we look at the history of uh, the Jewish people, we have another situation. If we look at the history of Islamic culture, and, you know, then you always have a scribal uh, class and a literate class in any particular culture. Sometimes that's a very powerful class. Um, we know that writing is a great form of power. You know, Claude Levi Strauss and his writing lesson, I don't know if anyone has um, invoked that particular story, but in Claude Levi Strauss's um, account of the writing lesson, he talks about a, um, you know, an indigenous uh, tribe that he visits where the chief sees this activity of symbol making and he sees his, you know, anthropological, you know, Western visitor doing this stuff with script and he imitates it. And he imitates it because he sees it as a form of magic and a form of power. And it is. You know, he's not wrong. He's right. And, you know, so there's this sense that, in fact, to know this and to learn how to do this is to be able to invoke something that is a code at another level, too. And I think we see that in the mythology of the alphabet. I, I don't know if anyone has mentioned Alfred Kellier's work to you. Do you know Alfred Kellier? The Psychogenetic Sources of the Alphabet? You don't know this book? Quite the book. Um, and uh, Kalir basically reads the alphabet as a cosmic code, a code in which the, I mean, he, he's taking off and away from the Sefer Yetzirah and from certain again, Jewish traditions that come out of 13th, 14th century Kabbalah, but he sees the alphabet as the code for the creation of the universe in all of its gendered, erotic, and historical forms. So he'll talk about, you know, the, the patriarchal A, and then the big bellied B, and then the birth of little Gimel, who comes along as a result of the relationship between, you know, the phallic figure of the A and the maternal figure of the B. So there are, you know, ways that the alphabet has been read um, as a, not as a, not as a kind of pictorial history, but actually as the code that enacts that procreative, creative activity on an ongoing basis. So uh, analogous to a very uh, Hebrew I Ching, uh, that it has um, the magical uh, uh, properties in the letters. Exactly. So it's separate from the way that we think of them as uh, sound representatives. Exactly. Yeah, the, I mean, alphabet symbolism is a field that's filled with idiosyncratic interpretations of letter forms as things that have magical properties and performative properties. They can, can do things by the shape that they have and by the act of their being made or recited or performed in some other manner. Hey, this is where you might be interested in some of David Abrams' work. Uh -huh. of He's actually a Slater Pan magician uh -huh. by trade who spent time in indigenous cultures and is a philosopher. And his book is, is actually really goes into exploring our, our separation from nature uh -huh. with, um, in, in our self reflection and in our alphabet. Uh -huh. And uh, it's very. Anyway, it's very interesting. I just had to throw that in there. Speaking, he really spoke to the, the magic uh -huh. in, in a sense similar and also on some different tracks. I have heard, heard of the pieces that you're talking about, just not been located by name or book. Oh, okay. The, the kind of uh, mystical power properties. Yeah, you'd find it fascinating. It's very hard to find the psychogenetic sources of the alphabet. It's not exactly a, a you know, it, it, a common a term that makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it would, right? So, um, but Alfred Kellier's work is not that well known. I always thought that, that there was some original, that, that, they, that they represented some kind of um, vector of mm -hmm. energy, mm -hmm. that they were bringing some kind of a charge, you know, it was like, uh -huh. like a chemical set, you know, mm -hmm. together that mm -hmm. forth 
meaning. Mm -hmm. At a level, it was deeper than simply the transcription of sound. Mm -hmm. And that, that those two have gone like this. Yeah, well, I think that's true. And I think the sense that the, I mean, certainly that's part of Jewish mystical tradition, that the letters of the alphabet are the elements of the universe, of the cosmos. And in the Sefer Yetzirah, the story is that, you know, every letter comes to God and says, let me be the first letter. Let, let me be the, the first act through which you bring the world into being. And, you know, God is so upset with the arrogance of these letters parading themselves constantly before him um, that in the end he picks the one letter that doesn't come forth. And that's Aleph. And he says, you know, I will let you be the first letter of the alphabet because you're modest. And, you know, there's a kind of humility there. There's other stories as well, but that's, that's one that story. There's a symmetry that radiates on mm -hmm. different levels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, there's, there's wonderful mythology about it. And then, um, oh, there's another alphabet as the elements of the cosmos um, story. I mean, again, of course, Jewish tradition is filled with that idea, and the letters are considered, you know, truly sacred in that way. Um, uh, it'll come back to me. I mean, I always have that an personal anecdote, which is that when I was a kid, I had alphabet paper on the wall of my bedroom. And uh, every night before I would go to sleep, I would ask my mother to ask me a question, because that's why I went to sleep. I wanted a really good question. And, you know, at one, one point, um, I said to her, and it wasn't so much a question, but an exchange, I said, is it really true that all of the words that we have are made out of just those 26 letters? And she said, yes, it is. And so I said, well, tonight I'm just going to sit here, and as I go to sleep, I'm going to look at those letters, and I'm going to find a word that you can't spell using those letters, because I couldn't reconcile the finitude of the alphabet with the infinity of language. It just didn't seem possible to me. Yeah. Let's see. You wanted to talk a little bit more about... Before we go, yeah. back to this point about the uh, uh, comparisons of literacy or literacy at yeah. different rates at different times and different cultures. It seems to me, um, and we're going to draw you out on this a bit, that though the alphabet has been as a, uh, a system of letters, there's letters and sounds, and sounds vary, yes. Um, and so that there seems to be some trajectory through history that has continuity, that the particular kinds of confusions that have to be processed in order to learn to read the alphabet uh, in relation to a language like English re represent a, a different and unique kind of challenge that in that sense is fresh and different and distinct than the kind of code cued run together speech that we might attribute to the Hebrews, the Greeks, or the Romans. Well, the major problem with the alphabet as it's currently in use for the English language is just the distance between the time of invention and the languages for which the alphabet was invented and the current use to which it's put. So in a sense, it's a kind of you know, a parallax problem. It, if two things start fairly close together and the language, uh, the um, Semitic alphabet worked quite well to, to represent Semitic languages. So there weren't these kinds of disjuncts. And when the Greeks adopt the alphabet from the Phoenicians, they add the vowel sounds because the Greek language doesn't have the strong consonant structure to its morphemes. And so the vowels are actually necessary to distinguish morphemes that are otherwise ambiguous. Whereas in the Semitic language and in the Arabic language, you um, have, uh, which is a you know, form of Semitic language, but in Arabic and Hebrew, the consonants actually help define the morphemes. So you don't actually have the same level of ambiguity. So the Greeks decide, oh, for our language we need to make explicit the vowel sounds because that will actually make the alphabet work better for our language. And that works fine, but we don't speak Greek, you know. <laughs> what we speak is English, and English is a hybrid language. It combines the legacy of Latin and German and all kinds of other contemporary sounds, and it's evolved. So the question is, what's the relationship of this old technology to new speech? And, you know, in some ways we could say the alphabet also stabilizes speech. I mean, it keeps it from evolving 
you know, too quickly, too. It's like, oh, there's a kind of anchor on the other side of this, which is the sort of continual repetition of every generation having to be re-indoctrinated into that code. So in a sense, that kind of keeps a certain stability, but language changes, and it's a living thing, and writing is a living thing. And so, you know, we see all kinds of transformations in every single generation and in every location. Um, you know, one of the sort of tragic effects of broadcasting is the erasure of local dialects and local regional accents. And I mean, I'd love to have regional fonts. I mean, I think it'd be great if, you know, every laptop came with a regional, a regional font. So you could have South Atlantic font, font, you could have California font, you know, you have a Yankee font. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pakika kind of, you know, font for those Bostonians. Just so that we would see it, so that we would, I guess the reason I find that interesting is just because language is material, it's physical. And there's a sense that somehow language is transparent. And so if we can stop ourselves from the kind of habit that makes you think that language is just nature and realize it's a cultural artifact that has material qualities to it, then we would see it really differently. Then the idea of a regional accent would be a treasure. It wouldn't be a thing that you would want to kind of go to finishing school and get rid of. So. You have to polish off. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. And that, uh, whereas the language may be a cultural artifact, the writing system is a cultural artifact turned technological, yeah. mechanical. Right, right. And again, that technology is inscribed in so many places and in so many, you know, sort of systems that depend upon it. If we think about the, um, you know, um, what was it, the, the Millennium Bug problem that never really materialized because of the way the dates had been structured into software, well, think about what happens if you try to change the alphabet. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> That's what happens. <laughs> Think about what happens. It. <laughs> um, if we think about what would happen if we tried to change the alphabet, just even in terms of the machine records that we have and the machine structures that are built on alphabetic code, we'd be in. You know, it would just be extremely costly. So to make changes, you're you're fighting a lot of inertia. And inertia, not in the passive sense, but almost inertia, almost in the active sense. And there's cultural resistance, but there's just also the economic resistance. And that was the thing that kept letterpress printing going so much longer than it needed to, was just that so many companies had massive amounts of capital invested in their printing equipment that they weren't going to switch to new technology until they saw that it had really become stabilized and was an industry standard. Yeah, it, it, the institutional inertia is the biggest. It's big. Yeah. yeah. Wearing a squeak back or something. Oh. I'm going to pitch this down so I can see what it is. Well, we're doing great. I really appreciate it. Um, let's go. You did a great job. And, and probably would sail over the heads of a lot of folks relative to the um, the difference between the continental clarity, mm -hmm. right? And right. Or this continent, and this continent. Well, you know, they can only there's only certain sounds that can bridge them. Right. Right. Exactly. So we don't have to worry about exactly uh, notating what they are. You can't put this next to this without this sound happening. It's kind of like they're stanchions on a bridge. And exactly. There's a mark that goes between them, and that's that. But Precisely. That, but, but as we lose that identity in, right. in, the, in the consonants, or as the consonants don't function that way, and we need to hook them together differently, then we start to develop the vowels. Yeah. yeah. So speaking to that in a way that might be a little bit more accessible would be helpful. Right, right. And, um, the, the other thing that I think is really remarkable about that, but it doesn't get touched on much about that part, is that somehow, for some reason, the Greeks were um, conscious of this. They decided, or the, the system decided, whether you, wherever you attribute the intelligence that did it, that, wait a minute, this is a great idea, but it doesn't quite work. We're going to make it work for right, this thing. Right, right, right. 
which is a different story than yeah. what happens later. Yeah. Which is kind of like mindless, well, this is the legacy system, this one's important, so we're just going to morph yeah. this peasant language, which we don't care about. Right, yeah. right, right. There's right. a different thing going on between those two that's really important, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't really know what the cause of that transformation was. In other words, when the Greeks become exposed to the alphabet through their contact with Phoenician traders, they inherit an alphabet that's about 17 symbols. Those 17 symbols worked for the people who were using them. They, they were sufficient to make a clear, legible, written record of that language. But for the Greeks, 17 symbols wasn't enough. They needed extra vowel sounds to be noted because their language depended on it. So they add the vowel sounds, they add the writing. Now it's important to remember that there were notation systems for vowels. It's not as if they didn't exist at all, but they weren't whole letters. They didn't really occupy kind of letter status and sit with the other letters. It didn't have a, a visual form and shape to them. So the Greeks actually add the vowels as letters. Why they do it, who does it, how that comes about, I don't know. And I don't know even what the theoretical suppositions are at this point about the motivating causes or the sheer sort of imaginative capability to invent a fuller system. But what we do know is that, again, in various local cultural circumstances, different letter forms come into play that suit a local language. And I go back again to my reference to the thorn, which is a letter that is unique within Old English and has status in Old English writing systems, but doesn't become part of the standard type case when we shift into the printing world. It exists very, very briefly in that world. So again, why the Greeks managed to do that, how they think it up, I don't know. Why, why that's the case. Except again, I think it's necessity, you know, the sense that, you know, this isn't, this isn't functioning. We, we need to do more with it. You must have talked to some folks who have a more clear knowledge of that particular transformation. It's, it's not so much the, the, the details of how it was done right. or who did it, but that as, as a system of, okay, here comes the alphabet, right. the people that are speaking this language, this doesn't fit, they right. adjust it. Yeah. Right? And the example that you described later about the uh, thorn or what's happening in England is different than that. Mm -hmm. right? um, well, it's different in some ways. Again, the, uh, they're based in the same sense that the language as spoken has requirements that the language as written doesn't meet. So you want to change the written language to better approximate what it is that you think you're hearing. Well, so well, in that I'm sense, there's a... My understanding of the primary reason for the dropout of that was the high cost of making printing uh -huh. fonts. Yeah, I, I, I think that's true. Though, even there, I'm not sure if that's why the thorn drops out. Um, it, again, you'd have to talk to somebody who really was a historian of, of English who would tell you what the, the story of the poor thorn. The, there are a couple of other letters, and I can't recall them at the moment, but the thorn always sticks in my... Well, well it would. The, the thorn would stick. <laughs> <laughs> so. The that's been passed down from some of the other linguists we've talked to uh -huh. has to do with the fact that the printing press technicians that come to England, you know, they've got, you know, Danish and they've got Latin and, you know, right. and they're saying, well, look, this is what we got. We're not going to make, you know, it's very expensive and yeah. to make other sets. Yeah. And therefore, the, you know, there's certain things we're just going to use this for. Yeah. Not like the chancery scribes do with right. their pens, exactly. so to speak, at their stage of the game, right. and saying, wait a minute, this is too complicated, we're just going to do this. Right. No, that's true. I mean, when William Caxton sets up the first printing activity in England, he has a thorn in his type case. But when the predominant source for type starts to be Dutch foundries, then Dutch foundries aren't particularly interested in adopting what they do for English usage. On the other hand, there are letters in Dutch typecases that are not in the English typeface, as I found when I worked in Netherlands for a year. And there's an IJ combination that's in Dutch faces because it's a 
a, a vowel that that pair. It's an i that's a Dutch sound that we don't use. So there, because the Dutch were so powerful in terms of the you know sort of printing industry, they actually helped to you know sort of insist that that particular letter combination be a, a form in their uh, type boundaries. This just triggers for me. Um, I don't know why I didn't think of this before, but in, as the empires in Europe, you know, they go through this uh, cycle, and that um, at the time that printing was kicking, the Dutch were a really formidable power. Huh? That's where they were the uh, kind of rulers of the sea for a while. It comes a little bit later, but they're definitely in the ascendancy, and it's one of the places where printing develops, and especially map printing. As we know, map printing has developed in Holland and in the Netherlands before any place else. Mercator and the Mercator projection, and earlier, some of the best first maps for navigation are the Dutch. And, you know, it's their trade, so they need the maps. And they also find a great industry in map making. So that becomes their traders, their merchants, so they also produce the best maps. That becomes another source of, of revenue and cultural status. So the world, according to the Dutch, is much of what we know in terms of how we see the world in map terms. Again, a cultural legacy that, I mean, talk about a, a curious relationship between a visual code and an artifact, the relationship between maps and the world and the experience of the world. A really interesting one, but that's another topic. <laughs> it brings to mind this really juicy episode of uh, the West Wing, where they... <laughs> A whole, a whole bunch of uh, uh, alternative map makers showed up at the White House arguing for why we had to get rid of our general map of the world. Right, right. Biases. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah, there's no reason for the North Pole to be at the top and the South Pole to be at the bottom and for the, you know, sort of Western Europe and, and North America to see themselves as on top of the world. So there's there's wonderful maps. Uh, Paula Scher, the designer, did a great map that is, a, you know, turned upside down. And, yeah, yeah. yeah, they're great. So... Um, um. In the first thing, just so, because this is such an important point, the Greeks give the uh, the alphabet the vowel that we've been talking about. That the, at the time that they stabilize, there is this correspondence. You said before the there really wasn't much difference between the letters and sound. There wasn't anything left over. There wasn't any need for more letters to represent the sounds. They didn't have more sounds than they had letters for. It was kind of a nice fit. And, and speaking to that kind of crisply would be boom, helpful for us. Well, the Greek alphabet has, I think, 22 letters, and those 22 letters represent the sounds of the Greek language perfectly well and utterly adequately. So there isn't a mismatch there to the same degree. Now, I don't know if that's still true with modern Greek, but certainly it was true with ancient Greek, at least as far as we understand the sounds of ancient Greek. And I think we do understand the sounds of ancient Greek pretty well from poetry and meter. I think that's how you can recapture how it's sound, how, what the sound of a language was, because it's so important to poetry. And so the difficulty then comes as the um, uh, alphabet migrates into different cultural contexts. Now we know that the Romans add some letters to the alphabet, and they see a need for letters that aren't present in the Greek alphabet. And, you know, it, it continues, you know, that process, again, continues, but only in a very moderate way. I think it, it, it speaks to the sheer force of cultural legacy that the alphabet, as inherited in language after language, seems to suffice, even though it may not have any relationship to those sounds at all. Now, where we see an interesting phenomenon, as far as that's concerned, is in the invention of the International Phonetic Alphabet in the period of the late 19th and early 20th century, which is the period when it starts to really stabilize. The International Phonetic Alphabet is a project that comes from the frustration of missionaries who are trying to deal with languages that have no relationship to Indo-European languages, and they want to be able to transcribe scripture 
into a legible form so that they can, um, I mean, a lot of this is missionary driven, it's also linguist driven. So, you know, the study of language and missionary work often go hand in hand. Some of the best linguists are, are, are missionaries. So we see the International Phonetic Alphabet develop, and that's a very interesting and complex alternative to the standard alphabet because as much as possible they try to use letter forms that are already in existence and recognizable but modify them with certain kinds of inflections or um, extra diacritical marks but it still isn't sufficient and you have sounds that are again really significant that are tonal sounds or even guttural sounds or what they call a glottal stop and you know sounds that are really important to be um, written and noted and the International Phonetic Alphabet is the attempt to try to find some universal code for noting any language that can be listened to, you know, heard and transcribed. So that's a, another, and it has, I, I don't remember now, but it has you know, like 140 different marks or something. Now of course they're not saying that every language has 140 different sounds. What they're saying is if you're going to be able to represent any language and have one code to do it, you need this complex of a system. So, so it's a, kind of building on uh, Melville's uh, musical speech. In there. Exactly, yeah. Um, Mel, uh, Alexander uh, Bell and um, Melville, what's Melville's first name? Melville Alexander was Alexander's father. Right, there's Alexander Melville Bell, there's um, uh, well, there's a number of, of people who really try to do a visible speech. I mean, the, the quest for visible speech is, is one of those wonderful um, ideas that captures imagination in every generation. So there are many attempts to find a, a, a writing form that will be transparent to the eye, allow you to make pronunciation, either because it works like a musical script or because it gives you instructions on where to put your tongue, your teeth, how much breath to take in, how to shape, you know, the organs of the mouth. So, you know, there's all these different kind of codes that are created, but they, they turn out to be just as difficult to learn, if not more, um, than the alphabetic code. But they're, they're wonderful ideas. Some come out of the teaching of the deaf, and again, the idea of, is there some way to visually signal to someone who has no capacity to hear how to actually organize the articulatory organs so that it, it, they produce a sound that is acoustically correct. So it's that relationship between articulation, speech, and acoustics, the ear, that a lot of those codes try to signal. So, um, but they're not trying to spell anything explicitly. Um, they're, they're trying to create another kind of code that then is a second level yet again of encoding. But some of those um, experiments go back to the Renaissance and attempts to make universal languages and there's philosophical language experiments in the 17th century. The idea that perhaps it isn't language that we want to encode but all of human knowledge and maybe not even all of human knowledge, but all of the way in which the structure of the world might be part of one grand design, a uh, very controversial topic these days. So, you know, again, there's um, all kinds of ways in which invented imaginative writing systems have really tackled the question of what is it that we know when we know writing. Um, just some quick lines. That we don't have evidence of writing systems that are much older than 3000 BC. I'd like to touch one more time on the relationship between the uh, Egyptians. Oh, yeah. And sure. Um, to what extent? The, the difference between the influences over the beginning right. of the alphabet and where we find the first alphabet, because right. they're different conversations right. that connect. Right. Egyptian hieroglyphics come into being almost fully formed, at least that's the evidence that we have, and it's somewhere around 2700 to 3000 BC. Egyptian hieroglyphics emerge at almost the exact same time as cuneiform writing. The question of cultural influence is there. It's not that far, 
distance geographically, do they get the idea of writing from each other? Or is it something that simply is a matter of cultural uh, human evolution to a certain point? But around 3000 BC is when we see writing emerge in both those places. The earliest evidence of Chinese writing is a thousand years later, around 1700 BC, and that's a highly disputed date. It's amazing that it, Egyptian hieroglyphics are as perfect as they are at the point that they appear. So they seem to either have been, had an origin that is lost to us because of the material support on which they were written, or they seem to really have been some kind of invention that was carefully thought through, organized, and brought into being. Cuneiform is older in the sense that we see 3,000 more years of evolution of those signs through those tokens and the numeric systems from which the writing system sort of takes its point of departure. That's great. Let's, let's go back and, and, and rather than going from the... Yeah, let's do the Egyptians in the... Yeah, well, but let's go back to um, the beginnings of the tokens. Oh, okay. There's the, to there's the uh, from scratching on bones to tokens to pots to tablets to... Yeah. That, just, just a brief pass through that. Sure. The... Um, as I understand it, the current thinking about the development of notation systems as tokens in the ancient Near East has to do with the development of hard grains. It has to do with the evolution of an economy in which there's a surplus that can be stored. Hard grains can be stored. And once you have an economic value product that can be stored, you want ownership, you want accounting, you want trade, you want some kind of administrative system, and the tokens are an administrative system. So they come into being around 6000 BC at the point when the hard grain agriculture actually reaches a certain level of sophistication. It's kind of amazing. Yeah, yeah. there's a um, an anthropological linguist Right, step, 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 right there with you. That's yeah, nice that, it, that may be where I got it. It's a, there's a, he's an um, uh, Icelandic or Finnish or no. He's a deacon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. You know, the, 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 the writing isn't, uh, writing is a, is like a cultural pimple. <laughs> there's uh -huh. a level of complexity that happens. And all of a sudden it, just it, it emerges, out. yeah, it exactly. Emerges in, in this, uh, now we we should talk about the Egyptian and cuneiform right, um, connection there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Let's describe them a little bit. Oh, okay. Oh, to tokens are great. I love the tokens. I appreciate the story of putting tokens in the you know in the pot, and then then later down the line, we don't have to carry these pots around. We can take and press them into the clay and flatten them. Right. 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 Imagine we we still we want to do this is to create this sequence where. You can uh, you, you get the idea of the scratching on bones, the tokens, the right. complexity going on, and then the uh, tokens in pots, the tokens as icons for impression. To I don't need those, I can write to. Right, this whole thing right. This. Yeah. Now the tokens are are wonderful for that because um, if you think about an accounting system, the first thing that's going to happen is that you're going to have a literal representation of things. I give you a goat. And you give me a, a token that looks like a goat because you're going to take care of my goat. When I want my goat back, I'm going to go and show you I've got the token for the goat. So that's a very literal form of representation. If I have a lot of materials that I'm exchanging with you and I want to have some record, then I'm going to want to, we're going to want to put that in some form of contract. And if we have a literal pot full of stuff and we want to seal that pot, we'll know that if that seal isn't broken, that we've got the same contract and the same arrangement. The truly amazing thing is when that starts to go through a process of abstraction. The first level of abstraction is to make an impression, a record. So you have one tablet instead of having all of these little tokens. It's like, oh, you have a tablet on which you can actually have a record of all of the tokens. So that's an image. It's not a thing. That's one level of abstraction. The second level of abstraction is when we understand that we don't need to literally press 17, 18, 19, 20 versions of a cow or a wheat sh shaft. What we can do is come up with a concept of 20 and represent 20. That's an amazing leap.
So that's what happens as the tokens go forward. We start with literal representations of things, aggregates of things, impressions of things, and then we get to representations of abstract concepts. Once you can represent a concept and you no longer need a literal thing to be represented, you are really in the world of the symbolic. We are symbol-making creatures. When you're in the world of the symbolic, you are truly in a world of human intelligence. Other species have forms of communication that are organized, that they use to mark territory, indicate activity among an organized social group. No other species has an abstract symbol language into which anything can be translated. And that is the human capability. For better or for worse, that's the human capability. That's excellent. Okay, good, 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 good. Well, this is really coming across great. I'm glad I don't see it. <laughs> Joe's is happy not to see it. <laughs> right, right. I'm not self conscious as long as I don't have to see myself. <laughs> um, You're great on camera. You are, you are so alive. Animated and sparkly and... Oh, good. Yeah, change tips. You would like some water or like a bathroom? I got... Right? No, I'm... Cool. <laughs> <laughs> it does have a nice part. I like that part. I want it to turn nice. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready for it to exhale, you know? Last <laughs> so, time, we had just come, you know, from Hawaii. I know. I remember yeah. that. You know? Yeah. And uh, we haven't gone back. Mm. We've been nonstop. Ready to... Yeah, I've never been, yeah. Oh, I hope you get to I know. You. Yeah, your tales were very vivid. <laughs> they left a good impression. Yeah, we're, um, we're, we've been in uh, Louisville for the winter. Uh huh. So, like, whoa, well, that's a different kind of winter than. Yeah, that's true. It's handling. I can really. Uh, ready for the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm ready right. to be able to get out and exhale in nature. Exactly. And not right. Cold or. Right. Or I know, it's the contraction, you know, that I don't like. I'm ready for expansion. So, uh. Okay, so what else do we need to um, Um, explore here? Now that we've kind of anchored the beginnings of abstraction and writing and symbol. By the way, that guy, Terry Terry Stegan, I was talking about, his Uh book was called The Symbolic Species. Oh, wow. The Co-Evolution of Language and the Brain. I have to write that down in the Abram, um, the sensual, sensuous one. You go to our website, interviews, Uh list... Okay, you'll find that both of them are in the click through to their Oh, okay. Purposes. Okay. Um, but uh, his basic point is, is that you know you cannot understand the brain unless you understand language as as one of the environments, one of the key components of the environments. It evolved. Right. Right. They've co-evolved in right. a way that exactly. you've got to understand. If you exactly. Talk about the brain or you want to learn about language. Right. And right. Language has evolved to be learnable by children. Right. 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 That's system, that's great. Then yeah. Evolved to be, yeah. uh, you know, uh, learnable by adults. The hell with the kids. Right. 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 Different thing. Right. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's a great piece of work. Okay. Um, so so let's pick up the the Egyptian to alphabet connection. Sure. We about the, the Egyptians. We just went back in time, um, or we talk about the um, tokens to uh, cuneiform. Those are the two gaps. Sure. Okay. Um, tokens to, to cuneiform. The the token system, for accounting purposes, was fully in place and quite developed throughout the ancient Near East by 6,000, 5,000, 4,000 BC. I mean, it was just, you know, all over the place. And so I think we have some reason to believe that indeed those tokens migrated. I think the archaeological evidence suggests they migrate into Asia Minor, into Turkey, and you know, have some real geographic distribution around the Mediterranean basin as well. If we take that seriously, then the notion of writing as an idea is already present throughout ancient cultures. It's not clear that there's any connection between those cultures and Egyptian writing systems. They look different, they're conceived differently. We don't see a counting and accounting system in Egypt before we see hieroglyphics. The Egyptian writing system, which comes into being as hieroglyphics, also develops subsidiary alternatives within it as that culture evolves. 
A hieratic script, which is easier to write than hieroglyphics, is developed for scribal purposes, business purposes, communication purposes. Sort of like the difference between doing, you know, chipping your letters and majuscules in stone versus being able to write in handwriting. You're not going to want to make every single grocery list that you create be something that you have to illuminate in order to get to the store with it. So script forms are cursives. They're, you know, more suited to the natural movement of the hand. And they're informal. That signals to you as well in the way that you receive the information. So the Egyptians evolve a hieratic script and they also evolve a demotic script. So the variants in the Egyptian uh, writing systems. Some of those are under cultural influence and some of those are simply for internal purposes. The Semitic groups who evolved the alphabetic system are closely related to Egyptian culture. And in fact, the Sinai Peninsula is part of the Egyptian landmass. So the um, sense is that indeed the idea of writing was fully present to the Semitic people and that they distilled from Egyptian sources a set of symbols to use for their own writing system. And there are alphabet historians who will trace and can trace the relationship of those symbols, whether it's on formal bases as visual signs or whether it's on conceptual bases as sound signs. There are connections that can be mapped pretty clearly. But we also see a very strong connection, because we're really looking at a geographical range here, between the distillation of cuneiform systems into a proto-alphabetic script as well. So there's a number of proto-alphabetic sign systems that contribute to the development of the alphabet as we know it in that area of the Mediterranean, at the far eastern end of the Mediterranean that stretches between the Tigris-Euphrates Valley to the north and Egypt to the south. Yeah. Good. Um, so do you, do you favor the opinion here, uh, or whatever opinion you have, I mean, that, that somebody was um, living in these worlds and um, you know, invented, intuited some kind of an upgrade that blended them? Was there the right. great phonemic awareness uh, insight? Oh, I could just deal with sound, right? In a way right. that was uh, unique to the birth of the alphabet, but different than these other systems? You know, the cuneiform scripts evolved to a phonemic code right around the same time. So there are earlier precedents. The alphabet doesn't have a unique claim on representing sound. And it's much more efficient than representing words. And the cuneiform scribes understood that. So there are sound-based cuneiform scripts that predate the alphabet. But writing cuneiform also has its difficulties and limitations. So the alphabet is more suited to a wider range of different materials for its production. To, to some extent, you said this in, in Alaska, that was really good, and you touched on it a moment ago, I'm going to go back and see if we can hit it a little more crisply, which is this difference in the uh, ecology, economy of writing, mm. that, you know, you, don't, you can't write you know, complex visual illibility. You know, right, like, right. Like you said about the grocery store, you elaborate that a bit. And that also there must be some difference in the efficiency of, of doing cuneiform versus right. writing in the alphabet. Right. That, that's part of what brings all these things together and writes it off into right. the beginnings of our thing. There was a great thing that you, you spoke of streamlined speech. Uh -huh. if, you're if you're recording something, you're not going to have to want to write a, a picture. Right. Every word you want something that you can right. streamline it. There's a really great yeah, piece. Yeah, great. Right, right. Um, let's see. There's a, a number of different things there. Um, uh, let's see. Um, the relationship between available technology or available means for making a script and the shape that a script has is something we also have to think about. If you're living in a river valley and you've got a lot of wet clay and you notice that it captures and keeps impressions, then that seems like a pretty useful way to make a writing system. 
if you're living where you've got papyrus and you can make a you know lightweight material support and you can figure out some way to make ink, then that seems like a pretty use, useful way to, to create a writing system. But um, I think the, the thing to recognize is that we don't have one writing system. We have all kinds of writing systems. Because we could argue that, in fact, writing in print, writing in LED displays, writing on billboards, writing in sequins, writing in paint, you know, writing in magic marker, that these are all, in a sense, variants of a code. The letter forms might be similar, but the material aspects of the way in which writing presents itself to us carry a, carries a great deal of information. And my favorite example of that is always the stop sign. If you're going to make a stop sign and you're going to take a red magic marker and you're going to write the word stop on a piece of paper and you take a thumbtack and you put it up at the end of your street, you're not going to get that much adherence to the imperative stop. So the material aspect of writing's production actually goes beyond simply being, you know, an incidental aspect of its meaning. The writing and the material can really relate to each other. The difficulty of trying to create a script that can accommodate itself to a wide range of cultural uses is not insignificant. We have to recognize that one of the, you know, one of the first impulses towards the writing of a shorthand attributed to the slave who was supposed to take notes for Cicero when he was giving his speeches in the Senate. Now Cicero could compose some sentences, you know. I mean, that guy could make sentences that look like thunderheads. They start to build, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more complex. And there's poor Tyro sitting there trying to figure out when is that sentence ever going to end. So uh, presented with those kinds of circumstances, you're not going to be content with a writing system that requires that you isolate different units of meaning as if they are representable in pictorial form. You're going to want something that will allow you to follow the sounds of speech pretty fluently and also be something that can be efficient, condensed, and able to be transcribed later. Um, not sure what we missed there. What you just said, mm -hmm. the way that you said it was good, but I'd like to just connect that to being the, an important difference between the alphabet and the, all the other writing systems. Is okay. the degree to which it lends itself to that just fluid transcription. Right, speech, right. That the, in a way that the, the, the others don't have the same advantage for it. Right. That point. Yeah, you know, it, it, it raises a question. I'm not actually sure to what extent the hieratic script was used for speech transcription. Um, I, I just don't know. Um, but certainly, because the alphabet is an efficient system, it may be faulty, but it's efficient, um, it can be used to transcribe speech pretty easily. The, um, you know, and, and it, we know that the alphabet isn't what you use when you do shorthand. You actually have word signifiers. I mean, shorthand is a curious thing because it's a combination of word signifiers and secondary codes to you know, sort of let you know what it is that you're indicating in shorthand, and then some degree of actual kind of, uh, you know, more specific notation. But the alphabet is efficient. I mean, maybe the alphabet may be faulty, but it's efficient, adaptable, as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I press with people that I've been talking to is this. The alphabet as the uh, kind of the greatest invention in the history of history, uh -huh. Western history anyway, the greatest invention. Of and uh, Frank Cross says, uh, you know, it, 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 you'd have to think of it as one of the you know, cardinal inventions of all time. Um, and so different people have different pieces on that. And you said, um, yeah, nothing is more basic, really, than the alphabet. It's amazing. That was your kind of comment yeah. on that point. Do you have any other... Can you either re-say that, if you feel comfortable with the it, <laughs> or something else that speaks to your sense of the uh, enormous, uh, least significant dimensions of this. Right. Um, well, I have my favorite quote I can read here. I love this quote. <laughs> um, this is the quote from Humphrey Davies that's at the beginning of, of this. But um, this is Noel Humphrey Davies writing in 1853 on the origin and progress of the art of writing. It's a long quote, but um, I'll read sort of selectively. From the invention of letters, the machinations of the human heart began to operate. Falsity and error daily increased. 
litigation, and prisons had their beginnings, as also spacious and... Oh, no, I got it wrong. Wait a minute. Forget that. Start again. From the invention of letters, the machinations of the human heart began to operate. Falsity and error daily increased. Litigation and prisons had their beginnings, as also specious and artful language, which causes so much confusion in the world. It was on these accounts that the shades of the departed wept at night. But on the other hand, from the invention of letters, all polite intercourse and music proceeded, and reason and justice were made manifest. The relations of life were defined and laws were fixed. Governors had a lasting rule to refer to. Scholars had authorities to venerate. The historian, the mathematician, the astronomer can do nothing without letters. Were there not letters to give proof of passing events, the shades might weep at noonday as well as night, and the heavens rain down blood, for tradition might affirm what she pleased, so that the letters have done much more good than evil, and as a token of the good, heaven rained down ripe grain the day that they were first invented. Um, but, before we, before yeah. we read your books and you're got, we got into quote mode for a second, yeah. let me not shut you off. If you've got some kind of summarizing pithy, you know, the alphabet is this, I'd like to get it. Uh -huh. That was great. And, 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 and there's another quote, uh, uh, Herodotus, Oh. 420 that I want you to read. I'll I'm have to find it, yeah. That. Okay, I'll have to find it. If, if um, I've got it, I'll turn it to you if you want. Uh, Phoenicians who came with Cadiz and Oh, yeah, the Phoenicians are game with Cadmus, that's right. Yes, Cadmus. Um, is that, is that not in there? I no, it's, I, I'm sure it's in here. I, I, I hope it's in here. I don't know. We'll see. Herodotus. Yes, right. I don't know. I don't see the quote, actually. Just one other page where it might be. Um, what shall we say about the marvelous alphabet? That is. Ah, yeah. Here I can do this one. The Phoenicians who came with Cadmus introduced into Greece, after their settlement of the country, a number of accomplishments, of which the most important was writing, an art till then, I think, unknown to the Greeks. At first they used the same characters as all other Phoenicians, but as time went on they changed their language and they also changed the shape of their letters. Thank you. Um, you go from that to a Greek historian, you know, who says, yeah, and a couple hundred years later you got homework. <laughs> right, so right. these dots connect, and that's a really nice piece. <clears throat> um, did, you, did, you, did you ever interview Derek de Kirchhoff? Was he one of the people you came across? I don't know if he's still around. Um, well, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a fan of the alphabet. <laughs> what can I say um, about the alphabet as I mean, the great invention? We look around and I know. Where can you not see its Right. Effect? Yeah, a few, yeah. Um, a few technologies have been... No. It would be hard to find a technology within the history of human culture that has been as long-lived, as influential, as powerful, and as flexible as the alphabet. Okay, thank you. You're doing okay with us? Yeah, right. fine. Um, the idea of enfranchisement, enfranchisement of literary, literary enfranchisement, the idea of mass literacy, is really a very modern notion. Yeah. I'd like you to pick up on that piece at some point. Sure. Just how, again, um, <clears throat> from our understanding, you know, in the 16th century, there were like 5,000 people in all of England that could read and write. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. right? Uh, during the Dark Ages, there's 1 or 2%. You mentioned 50%, yeah. you know, in the elite of Rome. Right. Know, 10, right. The even women, stuff. even women could read and write. Right. Again, <laughs> it's something you have to ask the question. What is the difference in challenge? Mm -hmm. Right? Right. And, uh, and that's where, in our series, we're coming from the birth of an infant and the neurological nourishment of uh -huh. the oral language environment and how that develops the, 
Phonemic awareness distinctions and speed of processing and everything else that either enables them to hit the confusions of the alphabet and go through it, or right. if it's insufficient, kind of bounce down right. a little bit. So right. we're, the, we're not saying it's all about the alphabet. It's all about right. our code system. Right. But we are saying our code system represents a unique, um, artificially confusing challenge that mm -hmm. depends on a lot of variables right. when we hit it, whether or not we're going to get through this thing or we're going to be harmed by it. Right, right. Well, yeah, no, I, I think it's very true that, um, after all, all humans can learn language, almost all humans can learn language, unless they have some very serious neurological problem. But not everybody can learn to read, and not everybody can learn to write. And the expectation that literacy is a foundation for particip participation in daily life is something that comes really only with the modern period. And that has as much to do with an economic value that's attached to labor that is dependent upon literacy as it does to other factors. Now, that said, we have to recognize that literacy has its advocates in other fields as well. First of all, in the field of theological study and the study of scripture, which is always going to be part of a culture. On the other hand, the separation between those who know and can read and those who simply receive the word is something that has its own capacities for producing power relations. When, when the United States is founded, one of the visions of the Founding Fathers, certainly Thomas Jefferson, is that literacy is essential to a democratic culture, that you cannot have democracy if you do not have a literate, educated population. And I think that's true. I think that enfranchisement does mean literacy. The dark side of that is that we tend to equate literacy with reading and writing. And though that's the you know, sort of specific definition, it downplays the capacity for knowledge that comes out of embodied experience, art, visual experience, performance in the body, trade, sensuality, all other forms of sophisticated understanding of experience and its processing are given a different stigma in our culture because they aren't considered part of the instrumental force of literacy that's encoded in certain kinds of writing. So there's a way that we can see modern literacy as intimately bound up with what we call administered culture. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we'd like to be in a position where we could be meta enough to discuss the pros and cons of literacy in our cultural evolutionary yeah. processes and in, in inequity and, and so forth. And yet, you know, for our children, like it or not, while we have this conversation, their lives are all but faded by how well they come through this. Right, exactly. And they don't have a choice. It doesn't just, well, it's like, Basketball, and I don't think I'll play basketball. You know, it's right. Not, uh, reading, I don't think I'll do reading. Right, you know, exactly. Like, there is none of that. No, you can't function in contemporary life if you can't read and write. I mean, you, you can't. I mean, you're just excluded from, you know, the sort of day-to-day -day essentials. You can't vote, you know, you can't write a check, you can't function economically, pol politically. You can't even really function socially um, without that capacity. Yeah, beautiful. That was, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> We, we talked to uh, president of Pro-Literacy, World's Largest Adult uh -huh. Literacy Organization, or the National Center for Family Literacy, or, or people reading it fundamental, reading is fundamental, to concern themselves with kids, and trying to get all these different vectors, you know, those yeah. kind of, what's really clear is, is the enormous dimension of mind shame that goes with not getting through this period. Right, right. What, it's, not, it, it's not the um, lack of the enabling mm -hmm. power of mm -hmm. literacy, of reading, mm -hmm. is the interface for literacy that is so important here. As important as that is, it's the collateral yeah. damage. Yeah, yeah. The collateral harm right. that happens to someone's sense of themselves right. when they come to this and don't get through it to a sufficient right. degree. It's, it's devastating. Right. No, I think that's true. You know, self-esteem just plummets if you feel that you're a complete failure at the thing that is perceived to be fundamental to functioning in a contemporary world. Um, that's part of what we're up to here at the press, actually, is encouraging people to uh, find another route to literacy or an amplified route to literacy um, through printing.
and uh, revival of old technology. So hope, hoping that the enthusiasm that comes from actually, you know, working with letters and holding them in your hand and setting them letter by letter actually gives you a different relationship to, to literacy. So. I think that's, that's great. It, it, it's an analogy. We're also telling the story of the reformers. Mm-hmm. And, my, oh. and, and that connects up. We've, we've talked yeah. to the president of the Theodore Roosevelt Society and got, you know, their inside view uh-huh. of what happened with him. And, the guy who wrote the book on Andrew Carnegie and how he put the money in and how that got right. in the newspapers and all that. But when we talk about this, um, perhaps one of the most interesting stories is Ben Franklin. Uh-huh. And what, what Ben Franklin would look just at home, sitting right, there. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, and here is a guy who's bright, you know, kind of a, the, the, the Da Vinci of... Right, right. right. Like, and he's played with letters at this mechanical, yeah. uh, you know, elemental level. As well as being, you know, the philosopher of mind thinking about how it all works. Wait a minute. Right. Right. Let's, let's do this differently. Right. Well, I, I mean, I think you know, we we talk about the disenfranchisement and the you know kind of crushing effect on self-esteem that occurs when people can't master, at least in a minimal way, the basics of reading and writing in our alphabetic code. But there's another level of just empowerment that comes when you teach somebody to print. And they set something up in type, put it on the press, run a sheet through, and it's printed. Because printing has another whole level of authority in this culture. But there's also the other specialized knowledge. I mean, for those of us who love letters, for whom getting over that barrier is not a problem, you know, like, yes, you know, give me the letters, I want to be there. Um, There's still an incredible sort of ignorance about letter forms, where they come from, how they're differentiated, the different faces. You know, people treat letters, you know, the way that sort of, you know, we treat bats. It's like they all look alike. I mean, you know, all curly-headed people, we all look alike. You know, we don't. Every letter... He, the, the face of it, the shape of it, has a history to it. Somebody created it in a certain time with certain expectations. It has its own whole cultural ethos according to whether the serifs are made or not made and the, the slant, the axis, the movement. Everything about the letter tells you. It's like a little, you know, sort of key that unlocks the whole history. So, you know, for those who want to go the other direction, <laughs> once they're over the threshold and want to sort of explore this amazing world, the letter forms are infinitely interesting inexhaustibly interesting. I've never met a letter I didn't like. Some letters I don't want to hang out with. It's only so much wedding text you want to set, you know? <laughs> so, you know? But, uh, yeah. But anyway, that's a whole other topic, too. That's for the enthusiasts. When I was teaching at Harvard and the students wanted to, went around asking all the faculty what their favorite works of art were, and they came to me and they said, what's your favorite work of art? And I said, the alphabet. And I went, oh, that's, that's new. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. That, that is uh, pretty self-defining in yeah. a beautiful way. And, and why you wrote the book. And why yeah, you wrote I love the alphabet. Really um, nice. Yeah. So um, let me get to the uh, kind of cognitive side that you spoke to. It's funny, we talked to a lot of uh, you know, cognitive scientists and neuroscientists about the What's careening around in the cranium, so to speak, <laughs> put together. And, uh, and your quote is the one that we've used um, extensively as being the one closest to um, really zinging this, which is um, when we read, we're taking a code and we're getting instructions from that code. Oh, yeah. A series of cognitive processes. Right. Of kind of performance. Right. right. Um, the response. Yeah, a, 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 uh, we were actually doing is enacting a cognitive performance in response to a set of instructions. Right. Yeah. So, um, so if there's some angle on that that we could get a fresh catch on that, that would be good. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that uh, contemporary cognitive studies has enhanced our understanding of the way in which the human processing of information works. I think older models of reading, writing, learning tended to see books, letters as static artifacts and to think that somehow we received the messages from these artifacts directly as if images went through our eyes to our heads. But we recognize now that to a great extent any act of reading is an act of interpretation, that what a text provides us is a provocation 
It's a provocation for performance, and that every reading of a text recreates that text. And a book, a poem, a line of type on a page is simply that. It's a set of instructions according to which we perform. We make a reading. We make a text. It's a provocative instrument. It's not the thing in itself. It's that which provides a stimulus for us to enact with that stimulus so that we you know, perform the text. We make it. It's actually Mary Carruthers' work on um, the, the history of um, uh, reading in medieval periods and churches that in part stimulated um, uh, our thinking in that direction. Um, well, uh, um, having to do with the performative orality rather than the silent reading. No? I don't think it really matters. I mean, performative orality certainly has a cultural history of its own and a specific place within certain kinds of practices. But I think if you do silent reading, you're also performing the code. Or the code is performing through you. Yeah. I mean, our take is that what we're talking about is a, a, uh, it's a you know, virtual reality projector. It is. That we, we're, yes. We're, that is, that is code instructed and yes. informed. Yes, absolutely. Right? It's a projection. We make a projection. You know, the page meets us and we meet it, and someplace in the space between the two, meaning it's made. And it's made as an act of performance. Yes. And there's one thing, once we're, once we're uh, transparent to the code's confusions and we're just reading along, that's true. But it's also true at the assembly level uh -huh. that's, that, that's getting letters to make sounds, to make words that we're then doing the subsequent steps to. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, think about how difficult it is to read aloud versus how easy it is to speak. Why is that? And we see it all the time when we try to get students to read poetry so that they hear it. And they stumble, and they can't hear it. They can't speak it. So, And these are very bright students. You know, to read aloud requires that you actually engage. It's almost as though you have to mesh with that code in a time sync so that that sequencing and processing can happen, you know, in a kind of parallel way so that all of those gears have to mesh. That's a lot of gears to mesh. And, uh, but we can speak without difficulty, you know, no problem there. Right. And in some cases, somebody might be able to read easier silently than articulated because we've got more systems, more right. bandwidth being consumed, running right. all these different things concurrently and in sync. Right. Well, one of the big discussions in the 19th century really was, is there a little voice in your head? It's a wonderful whole set of discussions about that little voice that seems to speak in your head as you read silently. And I don't know what your experience of this is like, but, you know, I know that that voice is in my head most of the time. It's a voice, you know, sort of narrating my life to me, reading things to me, talking to me. It's a very funny thing. As I get older, of course, it's also being said aloud, but that's another problem. Um, but the voice in your head as an idea is still, I think, at a remove from the actual act of having to read aloud because there's a kind of passivity to that voice that doesn't require that you also make your speech organs perform. And, you know, it's not clear to me that when I read, I speak aloud in my head what it is I'm reading. And I'm, I can skim and speed read very quickly, so I'll often be able to take in large amounts of information from a visual field without having to actually process it through the speech sounds. Right. That, that's the characteristic of somebody who's a good reader right. on the other side. During exactly. During the beginning phase for a person that, that's up, right. that did grow up in an oral language environment that is a that's right. listener, this transcri transcription system has to lift those two to some point to take off together to transcend the sound. That's right. And it's very labor intensive. And I think where you feel that as an adult, even if you're a fluent reader and writer, it's if you try to learn a foreign language. And if you try to learn a really alien script, then you're, you're doubly cognizant of that. We call that uh, inner voice self-talk story. Uh-huh. And one of the things that uh, we do as we travel around, particularly with little, little kids, is uh -huh. ask junior was. And um, it, what's, what's really amazing is, is that most children, of course, they hear the book, they hear they're talking. Inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're not sure that it's okay to talk outside about uh -huh. the fact what's going on on the inside. Right, right. <laughs> really, that's so funny. Amazing. Yeah, that's Let's funny. See what else we got. It's really important because when you ask who, who that voice is, sometimes it's parents, but most often it's God. Huh. And the, 
the, and the interesting thing is, is what what force and power. I mean, yeah, if you're just as an, a learning ecologist, uh -huh. you have to say whatever this voice is, however that phenomena works, it's one of the most significant learning environments and huh. really influences so the interesting. evolution of the course of how right. it grows and develops. Right. But there's hardly any conversation about it. It takes yeah. it seriously. That That's sense. really interesting. I wonder what the conversations are about that. I mean, I would think a psychoanalyst would say it was the superego, you know. For me, it's devils and angels. I mean, it's, you know, all those little things on this shoulder and this shoulder are going, and then it's like, and then it's like, yeah, I think a great um, <laughs> metaphor to this is Gollum. Uh-huh, Gollum, yeah. Oh, yeah, Gollum, Gollum and Spiegel. Spiegel. He's working this voice out I know. in this way that, that we see as this struggling character dealing right. with the, right. the good, the bad, the devil, right. and, and the demon, the angel. And, uh, right, right. Actually, yeah. and interestingly, um, little six-year-old that we did interview where they had struggled reading, one of the voices in her head, because many it's it's the different voices, right? It's uh -huh. just the one voice that we hear. And one of her voices was, you can't read that book. You can't read that book. Oh, wow. Inside of herself. Wow. Was, uh, a voice inside yeah. of her making yeah. fun of herself yeah. because Oof. she was having trouble reading. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. how can you live with that? Yeah. What happened? See, that's the other thing. When you get into the neuroscience of affect, uh -huh. right, is how quickly, just like reading is this unconscious automatic projector system that's going on, what happens when you develop a, a shame aversion to the feeling of confusion that goes right. on with that projector right. before the level you're even aware of it? Right. 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 That's what we're, that's the significance of reading. Right. Right. No, I know, because then you just block and you can't even begin to, to process. Before you're aware of it, you're yeah. avoiding the yeah. things that, that yeah. engender the confusion, that yeah. elicit the shame that you don't want to feel, and that your, yeah. your, your sensors are trying to avoid, yeah. but it's decapitating. Yeah, it is. Well, I work with that at a different, in a different area and a different level, which has to do with the way in which people respond to contemporary art. Because especially adults, kids know, they'll go in and just, you know, they see what they see and they respond to it. But adults are so, again, shame averse that they're so afraid there's something they're supposed to know before they even see it that they don't see it. They can't look. They, you know, they cannot process visually. So It's interesting that you're keying on that. that, you're, that you're, there's a, a neuroscientist at the University of Kansas we talked to who's developed a way of monitoring people as they come into reading experiences. And they can tell a lot about their the nature of their psychology and depression, particularly oh. depression, by watching their brain's response to certain words that oh. that, that have button power. With That's them. really actually, interesting. They can actually watch a sure. of words go by, which we're reading, and see the disturbance and almost wow. diagnose. Wow. They're going to get to a point where they can diagnose a wow. lot about what. That's going fabulous. On by looking at the, how the word creates charge effects in the mind. Right? And so they can do you that can in do real time? With, yes, and you can do that with art. You can do that with art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. With images, that, that, uh, yeah. especially ones that unfold in some sequence or dynamism that would create a revelatory difference that you could cue effect against meanings. And yeah, yeah. The hardest thing is to just you know get people to, to trust that they can see what they see, hear what they hear. You know, adults in particular, as you know. Yeah, when you get a lot of years of infrastructure that's automating your avoidance to these things, it's hard to... Yeah. We're so complicated. This, um, I do want to go back. Um, I don't know if you, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, uh -huh. but I don't know if you would be willing to read this, that really succinct definition of reading that you gave us sure. in the first one, simply because I've watched people when we when we share this and they kind of they go. Whoa. Sure, if you give it to me and let, uh, and and let me read it a couple times, then I'll be able to say it too. I won't have to read it, okay. but. I don't mean to Okay, when we read, we take in a code, we get instructions from the code, and we perform a series of cognitive processes. What we're really doing is a cognitive performance of a set of instructions. You want me to do it again? If you do it again, just, just do it one more time. Looking at him. Yeah, looking at him. Got it. Okay. okay. Right. I forgot I was supposed to look at him. <laughs> I was looking at you. <laughs> okay. Um, 
When we read, we take in a code, we get a set of instructions, and we perform cognitive processes. So what we're really doing is a cognitive performance of a set of instructions. Thank you. In the original conversation, we had just come off the uh, movement of the uh, the adaptability of the alphabet. Uh huh. Right. That adapts here, adapts there. All right. And that um, when it comes to uh, the you know collision with English, it's insufficient. So we end up combining letters, and we end up with PHs and THs and all these. And da, 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 to kind of make up for the right. lack of letters for sound. And there's a, there's a, like she says, there's, there's an energy in that. But yeah. Right, right. But I don't know if we can get it again. I just want right. to touch on it. Well, I mean, when you have a language like English that has phonemes in it that aren't adequately represented by the individual letters of the alphabet, you have to come up with some kind of solution. So we have these conventions that we use, and we get GHs and THs and PHs that are supposed to sound like Fs and you know other kinds of regular you know peculiar pronunciations. But we just get used to the idea that these things are you know there to represent these sounds that don't have their own letters. Those of us that can read do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Those of us that are struggling, right. struggling with just that and a few other things connected to it. Okay, great. I'm uh, happy, I think. Please? Yeah, but you. Thank you. Got it? Anything okay. else that you want to talk about? No, no? I mean, you know, right. I could talk about letters forever, but I think we've done yeah. enough. <laughs> um, yeah, that does it. That does it. Thank you so much. Oh, no. It's nice to see you again. Anyway, it's sort of fun. Yeah, so. It's nice to see you. I'm glad that you're, uh, you're, you're creating this universe here. This yeah, world. me too. Yeah, that's good. You know, a little, that's a little daunting, you know, because somehow I have to make a lot of activity happen here. But I think if the space is right, um, you know, people are going to come. Really, they'll come. Yeah. The right ones will come. <laughs> yeah, well, it worked before in that little, little itty-bitty space. You know, we really got something going, and those people are, have stuck. So, I mean, we had, you know, 15, 16 people moving stuff, all volunteer, just coming.